All right, if you got a Bible, go to Ruth chapter two, Ruth chapter two. We are going through the book of Ruth. We've been in a series called Wonderful World, and it's a series about just compassion, grace, life, uh, generosity, and how God shows up and provides in ways that just really blow our minds away, that God moves in our lives when we get involved with his purpose and his plan. There's no telling what God has in store. And in this story, there's this woman who's lost her husband. Her name is Ruth. She's moved in with her mother-in-law who's crazy. Her name's Naomi. Uh, Naomi has lost her joy. She's angry. She's resentful. She wants to change her name. She's mad at God. She's mad at life. And Ruth is loyal to her even in the midst of her craziness. And Naomi is, she's mad because she lost her husband and her two sons. So she's a widow and she's lost anyone in her life that would help her to be able to provide for. And yet Ruth has moved in with her. And so Ruth chapter two, Naomi had a relative in verse one on her um, husband's side, a man of standing in the, the whole town of Bethlehem. His name was Boaz. Everybody say Boaz. So Boaz was, he was a strong man. He was a mighty man. He was the guy that all the girls wanted to date. He was the guy that all the guys wanted to be like. He was strong. He was wealthy. He was kind. He was someone that people respected. He had a good reputation. Verse two, it says, now Ruth, the Moabite, she was a foreigner. She wasn't from Bethlehem. She was living in this town. She goes to her mom, Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I may find favor. If you're taking notes today, I want to title this message. You can find me in the field. You can find me. Turn to someone next to you and say, you can find me not in the club, but in the field, in the field. Come on. This is a sermon for some singles today. Any singles in the house today? Come on. God's got your Boaz in the room. God's got your Ruth in the room. This is one of my favorite love stories in the Bible. It's better than Sleepless in Seattle. It's better than You've Got Mail, While You Were Sleeping. Whatever rom-com, chick flick you like, Ruth is one of the best romantic stories. This girl is heartbroken, and yet she's still moving forward. She is discouraged, and yet she's still moving forward. She's poor, and yet she's still moving forward. There's something to be said about a person who refuses to quit. A person who refuses to throw in the towel and say, there's nothing left for me. That Ruth had a victory spirit on the inside of her. She believed that God had something in store for her future. She believed even though her mother-in-law was cursing God, was angry at God, there was something inside of Ruth that said, let me go and see if I can find favor. Let me go see what God has in store in the field of my purpose. Right off the bat, one thing we can notice about Ruth is that she was a generous girl. She was a girl who was willing not just to serve for her own sake, but for her mother-in-law's sake. She didn't have to do this. Ruth could have been angry and said, you know what? Someone else needs to take care of us. She could have had an entitled spirit and say, you know, the government needs to take care of me. Someone else, this is someone else's fault. I, I, I can't do this on my own. I'm angry, I'm discouraged. But instead she chose to serve in a hard season. You never go wrong when you choose to serve. You never waste time when you choose to give out. I wanna look at one more scripture and then we're gonna go right into this. But Proverbs 11 verse 24, the message version says it like this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. One thing we're gonna learn about Ruth is that the more generous she was, not just her, but Boaz, the more generous he was, the bigger his world got. When you're generous with your encouragement, your world gets bigger. When you're generous with your resources, your world gets bigger. We're trying to teach this to our kids right now. We got five kids and we're trying to teach them how to share their toys, their stuffed animals, their kindness with one another. And sometimes they just get stingy. They just, I mean, they got a Kung Fu grip on their Buzz Lightyear toy, on their stuffed animal, whatever it is. They just can't let it go. And I'm trying to teach them, hey, live with open hands. Everybody say open hands. 
just put your hands in front of you. Just, just open them up. What if we started living more like this and less like this? See, the world needs believers with open hands, generous hands, a generous spirit. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. But then he says this, the world of the stingy, that's the closed hand. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Proverbs goes on to say this, those who bless others, the one who blesses others, ends up getting abundantly blessed. You heard today's testimony from Greg and Kim Ford. You've heard it from different families in the church that when people live to give, when we live to just share what we have, whatever we can, our time, our talent, our treasure, God continues to add more to our life. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. God, that we would leave today with a more generous spirit. Lord, a more open heart. God, for you to move in us and through us and break off every religious spirit, God. Break off every stingy spirit. Break off anything that's holding us back, any stale, dry, critical spirit, judgmental spirit. Break it off today, God. And let us leave with encouragement in our hearts, peace in our hearts, that you are for us and not against us. You are with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. And God, our best days are in front of us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Thank you so much. Can we give the worship team a big hand? They are so powerful. I love the worship here at Victory. Well, how many of y'all like to sleep? Any sleepers in the room? Y'all are like, I would be there right now if it wasn't for service. But We've got, we got about one kid in our house that likes to sleep. The rest of them just get up early. But we got, we got one, and she loves to sleep. She can just lay in her crib till 1030 in the morning. You just won't even hear anything. She's just sweetly asleep in there. If she's not asleep, she's thinking about sleep, right? She's laying in there. But I love that in this story, Ruth has a choice to either sleep in or get up, and she chooses to get up. For some of us in this room, we're not necessarily sleeping physically, but we might be sleeping spiritually through one of the best seasons of our life. Sleeping through opportunities that God has in front of us. Three things we can pick up right off the bat from the book of Ruth is number one, she got up. Everybody say, get up. Yeah. Number two, she got out. Everybody say, get out. Yeah. Number three, she got moving. Everybody say, get moving. Yeah. Get up, get out, get moving with God's purpose for your life. She got up from her discouragement. Whatever is weighing you down, today it's time to shake it off and get up. Every one of us in this room has been through something, a reason to stay down. But I love in the book of Ruth that immediately she made the decision, I'm getting up from this. I'm getting up. I have a choice. And sometimes we delegate that choice to our circumstances. We delegate it to what other people say to us, what other people do to us. But you have a personal responsibility to either stay down or get back up. Though a righteous man may fall seven times, he will get back up. Ruth got up. She got out. What do you need to get out of right now? Maybe it's a toxic situation. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a bad habit. Maybe it's just the fear of man, the fear of failure. Maybe it's the fear of lack. Maybe you've been trapped in a, a sense of uh, some sort of a house of just discouragement. I remember one morning, I was like eight or nine years old. This used to happen regularly in our house. Um, I shared a room with my brother, John, uh, who serves at Victory Manford. He's been doing a great job out at Victory Manford. He's out there right now. But um, I remember John and I, we shared a room together, and my dad would always come in early in the morning, and he would do this on Saturdays, the day that we were supposed to sleep in. And he would come in the room, and he'd go, come on, boys, it's time to get up. And we would be laying in bed, just pretending like we don't hear him. We were like, we don't hear you, Pastor Daddy, you know. And he would, he would come over, he'd pull the covers back, and we were like, no, Dad, no, it's Saturday. You know, when are we going to get a day off? And he would say, boys, it's time to get up. And we were like, no, it's time to sleep in. And then he would go, we had a, a glass door in our room, so he would come over there, and he would pull the curtain open. The sun would come shining in. And he would say, look outside, it's a beautiful day. And we were like, dad, we just wanna sleep. And then he would say, you smell that? And we were like, you got bacon cooking, you got eggs, you got you know orange Danish rolls, something good. And he said, no, I smell opportunity. And I was like, why is he giving us a sermon at seven in the morning? <laughs> Growing up with a pastor as your dad. And he goes, I smell money outside and we were like so we go over there you know scratching our eyes looking out the window we're like where's the money at he goes you see those leaves he's like that will turn into money and I was like how and he goes 
work. <laughs> this man was trying to get us to work at 7 a.m. And I said, well, how, how, like, how much are you going to pay us? And he goes, 25 cents a bag. And I was like, cheapo depo. You know, like our friends down the street, they're getting a dollar a bag, you know. But he's like, 25. So I'm going out there. I'm going to outsmart the smart guy. I'm, so I'm putting five or 10 leaves in a bag, bagging like 100 bags. And he goes out there. He investigates, you know. Delegation without investigation is an abomination. That's what he used to say. So he, he would come out there. He would investigate. He said, there's only 10 leaves in this bag. We're going to stuff all these leaves back into one bag, and you're going to start over. So we barely made 15 bucks, but he was teaching us the principle of hard work. This is something that society right now is struggling with all over the world, not just America, not just one generation, but it seems to be that there is a spirit of laziness that has plagued our society that thinks that we can just kind of coast by and somehow we're gonna find favor without getting in the field. The field represents your purpose and your purpose requires work. Everybody say work. Listen, anything that's going to be great requires work. Marriage, family, parenting, relationships, dreams, whatever it is God's called you to do, ministry, it requires work work. It requires us getting out into the field of labor and putting our hands to the plow. Isaac Newton's third law of motion says this, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you will get in the field, watch the, how God will bring favor into your life. So Ruth gets up and she says, let me go to work. Naomi says, go ahead, my daughter. So she goes out. Everybody say, get out. She gets out of her house. She goes into the field, and as it turns out, she was working in a field that belonged to Boaz. Just so happened. This is the way God works, providence. It's not a coincidence that this would happen. God has a plan. Anytime you start crossing paths with people, it's like God is connecting the dots. God's introducing you to new opportunities. God's preparing you for promotion. God's preparing you for greater things. Don't, don't, don't take anything lightly. Here she was. She just so happened to be in the field that belonged to Boaz. In verse 4, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, he had a kind spirit. He said, the Lord be with you. And they said, the Lord bless you, Boaz. Now, Boaz was interested right off the bat. In fact, it says he started looking out, and he says, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? Is she single? I remember, I remember when I went to ORU, and I was looking for, you know, who would be my future wife. I'd be worshiping in chapel with hands up, one eye closed, one eye open, just <laughs> scoping it out, walking through the prayer gardens, and uh, God had to, had to help me wake up and, and focus on him. And praise God, I found the woman of my dreams, my beautiful wife of 13 years, Ashley Hope Doherty. Somebody say, you can find me in the field. I found her serving in the church. The best place to find your future spouse is in his house. The best place to build a relationship that's going to last is in the house of God. You're going to go through all kinds of valleys and mountaintops, but can I tell you, the Word of God gives us a blueprint on how to make it through the cold seasons, the hot seasons, the difficult valleys and the mountaintops. There wasn't a couple in the Bible that didn't experience some sort of difficulty, but when they put God first, when they chose to serve God's purpose, when they got in the field of God's purpose, God always brought them through whatever they would walk through. The best place to find your spouse is in God's house. The best place to build your marriage is in God's house. So here Boaz is asking, he's saying, who is this girl? Who's this girl? He's flirting with her, right? He's asking people. He's like, tell me more about this girl. He was interested. And it's a good thing he was interested because she could have ended up with one of his relatives, right? She could have ended up with one of his crazy cousins. And Boaz does have some cousins that you want to be wary of. You want to you wanna be alert of his cousins. I was going to read this to you, but I feel like I would rather you get offended at someone else besides me. So I'm going to invite my friend, Pastor Jensen Franklin, to share this part of the message. Check this out. Ruth waited for her Boaz. She wouldn't just settle for anybody. The Bible said Boaz was a handsome man, a rich man, a spiritual man, a sensitive man, and that equals a husband. You got to wait. You got to wait on your Boaz. Boaz has some relatives, and if you don't watch it, 
You won't get the one God has for you. You'll get his relatives. To the girls, I found this on the internet. He has, Boaz is spelled B-O-A-Z. Everybody say B-O-A-Z. And so he's got some relatives called broke ass, po ass, lying ass, cheating ass, dumb ass, drunk ass. Don't go out with him. Cheap ass. Turn to somebody and say, I dated him. Locked up ass, good for nothing ass, lazy ass, and especially his third cousin beating your ass. Wait on your bow ass and make sure he respects your ass. Now there's your word. You wanted a word? You got a word. Quit dating anything on two legs. Let God take you through some loneliness. Let God take you through the wilderness so that when they come, you'll be ready. I'm almost... I'm not even going to look back at Pastor Hagee. I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not, he asked me All to right, come, we can that's his <laughs> So if that offends you, just email Jensen Franklin, not me. But he's got a good point there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to wait on the right guy. And you got to be willing to wait on the right person. I remember reading this book um, during my single season, and it was talking about dating and preparing for marriage. And I remember seeing this graph. I wanted to show it to you. That as you're pursuing God's purpose for your life, as you're headed in the direction of God, you're going to meet the right person on that same path. That put God at the top, at the center of your life. And as you're in the field of your purpose, as you're getting up, you're moving forward, you're choosing to repent, you're choosing to get your life on track with God's plan, you're going to meet the right person on that same path. Path. God has a person for you, but God has also called you to be the kind of person. God has called married people, he's called all of us to be the kind of person that brings him glory. Watch how Boaz treats Ruth in this. When Boaz finds out who she is in verse eight, it says, he goes over to Ruth and he says, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go anywhere else. Don't glean in any other field. I want you to stay right here. Work with me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting. Follow along after the women. I've told all the men, don't lay a hand on Ruth. And when you're thirsty, get something to drink from one of the water jars that we filled up for you. At this, Ruth bows to the ground. Here's what I love about this moment. The Bible always shows us in the Old Testament shadows of what's about to happen, like foreshadows of what's about to happen in the New Testament. Boaz represents our Redeemer, Jesus that he sees us in our lowly state. He sees us in our broken state. He sees us in need of mercy and he's watching out for us. Boaz is a little bit possessive, right? He's a little bit like, don't go anywhere else, stay right here. It's because he knows what's best for Ruth and God knows what's best for you. I'm so thankful we have a savior who's looking out for us, who is not aloof, he's not absent, he's not distant. He sees us and he has provision for us. He has favor for us. He has his will for us. And when Ruth hears this, watch this in verse 10, it says she bows to the ground. She's overwhelmed with gratitude. As we approach Thanksgiving, let us be reminded of the importance of just carrying a spirit of gratitude year round, that we would stay in a place of just total gratitude. God, who am I? This is what Ruth says to Boaz. Who am I? Why have I found such favor? I'm not entitled to anything. See, a spirit of entitlement says, I earned this. I deserve this. I, I made myself righteous. I proved my worth in the church. I'm a self-made millionaire. I'm a DIY. I do it all by myself. I'm so good at this. That's a prideful spirit. Ruth carried a humble spirit. She was humbled by Boaz's kindness. Let us carry that same spirit when we find the favor of God that we just say, Lord, who am I? God, thank you for your grace, your unmerited kindness in my life. I want the band to come out as we get ready to go into a time of worship. Everybody say, stay grateful. I would rather be embarrassingly grateful than snobbishly entitled. I would rather be like just 
crying, snot coming out of my nose. Just thank you, mom. Thank you for wiping my diapers as a baby. I'm doing it now for my kids and I see what you did for me, right? Like the older you get, the more thankful you are for your parents putting up with your crap. You know what I'm saying? Because now you're dealing with it. You came to church today. You're hearing all kinds of stuff. (laughs) Come on. You got to wait for your Boaz, someone who takes care of yo. And here's what I'm saying. (laughs) Be respect, but Never lose your attitude of gratitude. Never lose that that spirit of just thankfulness. Lord, I'm thankful. God, you've been so good. When Boaz hears her say this, he says, I've heard about what you did for your mother-in-law. I've heard how you stayed when you could have left. I've heard about the death of your husband. I've heard how you've walked through painful situations. You're in an uncomfortable place. You're around people that you don't know and they don't know you. You had, a, you had every reason to stay home, to sleep in, but you got up, you got out, you got moving in the field of your purpose. And watch what he says in verse 12. He, he prays a blessing over her that I wanna pray over you. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you've done. That's my prayer for you, church. May the Lord repay you. The Bible says that he casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. He remembers our sins no more. When you repent, God forgives you. But the Bible also says he never forgets the labor, the deeds that you have done for others. That goes with you into eternity. You know what doesn't go with you into eternity? Your house, your car, your clothes, your 30 pairs of shoes in the closet. Some of y'all got 40, 25, I don't know. All the material wealth that you cling to, none of it goes to heaven. The couch doesn't go, the chairs don't go, the rug doesn't go, the TV doesn't go, maybe the dogs go. I don't know, all dogs go to heaven. but, But what does go to heaven is what you did for others in his name. This is what Boaz says. He says, I pray that God would repay you for the way you treated your mother in law with kindness when you didn't have to, the way that you've served. You never waste time when you serve the kingdom of God whether you're on stage, backstage, in the parking lot. Y'all, we have amazing dream teamers that show up and volunteer in 25 degree weather outside, pulling people up into the church. We got people serving behind it in the nursery, in the children's church. Ruth had a servant's heart. Boaz says, I pray God would bless you. I pray that you would be richly rewarded by the Lord. I pray that the God of Israel would cover you with his wings, that you would find refuge in the Lord. And Ruth said, may I continue to find favor with you. You've put me at ease. You've spoken kindly to me. That's what I want to do. I want to put people at ease. I want to speak with kindness. I want, our, I want our words. I want my words to be laced with compassion. Not flattering words, but kind words. In a world that's so mean, people are so critical. We leave reviews at every place we go to and We feel like we got to judge everyone we meet. What if we started walking with that Boaz kindness to just treat people with courtesy, respect? You never know what your waiters walked through, what your waitress has been going through. And she might have taken extra time to bring that food out. But just remember, she's got some kids she's got to provide for at home. Just remember, everybody's facing battles that you don't know anything about. What if we started lacing our language with kindness and compassion? She said, you put me at ease. You spoke kindly to me. And I don't even have a standing. I'm not one of your employees. I'm a poor girl. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, eat some bread. Come and eat some of the the food we've got here. She ate all she wanted. She had a buffet. And once she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders. He said, make sure you get extra bundles for her. I want you to pick up extra, give her extra. I want her to have all that she needs and more. God's about to lead you into a harvest season. For those of you that have been laboring, you've been working hard, you have been sowing in tears. God's getting ready to lay up bundles for you. I just believe it. I believe in Malachi, that the, that the God who owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, he's about to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. And it'll be, be through peace, joy, your relationships, your finances. But Boaz was generous. He didn't keep score. He just kept giving. He just kept giving. He said, let's give her more. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. She threshed the barley she had gathered. She kept working. Somebody said, keep on working. 
she kept on working. She carried on and she went back to town. She carried it with her. She was a Proverbs 31 kind of woman. She was giving it all she got and God was showing up. See, I believe a lot of the promises of God are motion activated. God is going to do a lot of work for you, but he expects you to do your part. He, he does not reward laziness. He does not reward apathy. He does not reward mediocrity. This is why Paul said in Colossians, do everything as unto the Lord as if the boss was watching you, undercover boss. He's watching how you work. Show up on time, do your best, be leaned in, give it your all. And when you show up, God shows up. Some doors look closed until you get close to them and then you realize they're motion activated. The second you start moving towards them, they begin to open. Some sinks won't turn on until your hand gets right underneath the faucet. But when it does, the water begins to overflow. It begins to pour out. Some of you have been waiting for God to provide for you, but you haven't given him anything to work with. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. Show up in the field of your purpose. Start giving out, start serving. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. If you're waiting for God to expand your opportunities, to take you to the next level, what if you began to give him something to work with? I want to give you real quickly a few things we can learn from Boaz. Why was Boaz such an amazing man of God? Number one, he was generous with his compassion. He was generous with his compassion. Boaz was the son of Rahab. If you read your Old Testament, right before the book of Ruth, there's a book called Judges. Judges followed the book of Joshua. Joshua was the book where God sent the Israelites into the promised land to take Jericho. There was a girl in Jericho named Rahab. She was the only woman that was spared in the city of Jericho. She was not an Israelite, she was a foreigner. She laid down a scarlet thread. Now Rahab was known in the city as the town prostitute. She was Rahab the prostitute. And yet God spared her and her family, showed compassion used her to become a part of, she actually was grafted into the genealogy of Jesus Christ. When you look at the family tree of Jesus, it is, it's so good news for all of us. If you've ever had a flaw in your life, welcome to the family of God. God uses broken people, people that weren't perfect, people that were scarred, people that had walked through painful. If you've ever walked through something difficult, you're in good company in the Bible. See, Boaz knew what it was like to grow up in the home with a mom who had to figure out whatever she could do to make ends meet. And he watched as God showed her compassion. So when the time came as he got older to show compassion to someone else, it just naturally, forgiven people forgive much. People who've walked through a lot of painful things and experienced the compassion of God, they just over, they ooze with compassion for more people. Let us be a people who carries a spirit of compassion. Number two, he was generous with his compliments. He just complimented people left and right. I've heard you did this for your mom. You're such a great woman. I heard you did this over here. You're such a, an amazing one. He was just complimentary. He wasn't flattering. He was complimentary. Anytime you have a compliment in your mind, don't let it escape you. Go ahead and just release it out of your mouth. Just speak a kind word. You never know what someone's heard all day. Maybe they heard 10 critical things at work and you're one compliment. I'm thankful for people in this church that just walk around and they just give out compliments. Compliments are free to give, but they can save someone's life. It doesn't cost you anything to give a compliment. In fact, maybe today, what if you just left a compliment, just sent a text? You could just practice this sermon today. Just say something kind to someone in your family. I'm so thankful for you. You're doing a great job. I'm so grateful for this area. Number three, Boaz was generous with his courtesy. Courtesy is still alive in 2022. He was generous. He was opening the doors. He was being a gentleman. He was treating people with respect. That's missing right now in so much of our society where people, it's like dog eat dog world, just survival of the fittest. People being mean at the coffee shop, people being mean on Twitter, mean on Facebook. What if we just started flipping the script and just showing respect to everybody, courtesy to everybody? Number four, he was generous with his crops. Now, every single one of us has crops in the room. If you've got shirts in your closet, shoes in your closet, if you've got money in your bank, if you've got transportation, if you've got something in your life, you've got crops, you've got resources, you've got time, you've got treasure, you've got talent. Boaz shared it. He shared it with others. And the more he was generous, the more his world got bigger. 
the more generous you are, you never, you can't outgive God. God knows if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. God knows that if you're a generous person, you're the perfect candidate for him to keep on blessing. The more that God blesses you, the more he's called you to be a blessing. The more you have, the more God holds you accountable. You're not an owner, you're a steward. I'm a steward of victory. I'm not an owner, I'm a steward. I wanna keep on letting more people get up on this stage, testifying about what God's done. I wanna keep on inviting more preachers. I wanna believe in the next generation. I wanna keep giving more people second chances and third chances. I wanna keep on sending people into the mission field, blessing people. Why? Because we're stewards and we're called to be generous with our crops. Number five, he was generous with his credibility. He was generous with his credibility. By the way, back to the crops thing. When God blessed our church, I want the band to come out. When God blessed our church during COVID, we weren't, we were in a tight time that first week. We only had 5,000 bags of groceries between here and the Tulsa Dream Center. And we were just like everybody else in the nation afraid of what was gonna happen to the economy. We were told we had to shut down everything. But I heard the Lord say, give whatever you have away. Just give it away. Just release it. Release it this week. So we held our first outdoor service, gospel in the groceries, rooftop revival. Come on, you can't shut victory down. We just got a victory spirit in the middle of that. We just, you find out what you're made of when you walk through hard times. And uh, we gave everything we had away that first week. And I said, let's do it again. They said, we have nothing left to give. I said, let's do another grocery giveaway tomorrow. They said, Paul, we have no more groceries. The word got out to different members. They said, we want to pay for groceries at Walmart, at different stores. We ended up giving 16 million bags of groceries. We outgave Amazon. Jeff Bezos with billions of dollars didn't give more than victory during the, co- the pandemic. Come on, this is the most generous church in the world. This is the most generous church in the world. And the more we gave, the more God continued to bless this house. We built the next generation building during COVID. COVID. We expanded. We continued to minister in the Dream Center. We continued to give out. We were able to partner with other churches and minister to other people. And we're going to keep on giving because that's who we are. He was generous with his credibility. In other words, he shared his name to give Ruth opportunity. What if someone was waiting on your credibility for their opportunity? Would you be willing to put your name on the line to vouch for them? This is what Barnabas did for Paul the apostle when he was labeled as a heretic, a terrorist, a bad guy, untrustworthy. We can't trust Paul. Barnabas said, you can put my name on it. Barnabas never wrote a book in the New Testament, but because he was generous with his credibility, he helped pave the way for a guy who would write half the New Testament. Boaz gave credibility to Ruth. And then sixthly, he was generous with his commitment. He was generous with his commitment. He was committed. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if someone asks for your jacket, give them your shirt too. If someone asks you to go with them a mile, go a second mile. Boaz was committed to the second mile with Ruth. He was willing to go all the way to help her in whatever way he could. He was in love and she was in love too. In verse 19, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Someone took good care of you. Look at all these bags of grain. Ruth told her mom all about it. She said, the man I worked for, his name is Boaz. Naomi said, the Lord bless him. His kindness to the living and to the dead has not gone unnoticed. This man is our close relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. In other words, he has the rights to become the husband to Ruth. Ruth the Moabite said, he even told me I could stay and continue working in the field and to finish out the harvest season there. Naomi said, that's good girl. Keep going to his field. Don't go anywhere else. Praise God, she got wisdom from the elders. And then Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz. She continued to live there. We're gonna pick up next week on that. I just wanna end with one, one last, a few thoughts about Ruth. What can we learn from Ruth in, in Ruth chapter two? What, what, what kind of spirit did Ruth live with? Number one, she lived with the spirit. The buck stops here. She took responsibility of her past and her future. She didn't wait for someone else to go to work for her. She decided that day, I'm going to work. The buck stops with me. Just say that with me. The buck stops with me. So often we wanna play the blame game. It's God's fault, it's their fault, it's the church's fault, it's the government's fault, it's my ex's fault. 
But what if we just took responsibility from this day forward? I'm letting go of my past and I'm grabbing hold of my future. I can't change what people did to me. Doesn't make what they did okay. It just means I'm no longer going to play the blame game. I am taking responsibility for my future. I'm not going to stay home. I'm not going to have just a sob party for the next 10 years. I'm not going to just eat ice cream and watch Netflix until I die. I'm going to take responsibility for my field, for the purpose that God has called me to walk in. Number two, I will be a servant to others. She had a servant's heart. She was a there you are person, not a here I am person. You, it, listen, if, if serving is beneath you, then leading is above you. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. Jesus set the example to be a servant to others. If you want to go higher, you got to get lower. If you want to climb the ladder to success, you got to become a servant of all. She was a servant leader. Number three, I am a person of action. I seize this moment. Carpe diem. Seize the day. She was a right now girl. She wasn't a procrastinator. She wasn't saying, one of these days I'll study for the test. One of these days I'll write the paper. One of these days I'll become a tither. One of these days I'll go through growth track. One of these days I'll join the church. One of these days I'll start taking my life seriously. One of these days I'll break this addiction. One of these days I'll go through the discipleship course. One of these days I'll do what I know I need to do. No, she decided today. Seize the day. Carpe diem. We're not promised tomorrow. That's why I love seeing that, that testimony that today was the day for her to get baptized today. Today is the day for salvation. Number four, I have a decided heart. My destiny is assured. She wasn't a wishy-washy girl. She wasn't fickle. She wasn't in for one day and out the next day. She was a, a decided person. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Number five, today I choose to have an attitude of gratitude and hope. She was a grateful person. And you and I, we can be grateful too. Grateful people are happier people. The more grateful I am, the more happy I am. The less grateful I am, the more cynical, skeptical, depressed I get. If I'm always thinking about what to complain about, I should come to church and instead of looking for five things to critique about the church, I should look for five things to be thankful for in church. Instead of critiquing the cuss words on the screen today, just be thankful that the sermon was about Ruth today. Just be thankful that you got a Boaz in your life or that God's bringing, bringing the root. But what if we stopped looking for what's wrong in the world? See, this, this series, Wonderful World, it's about opening our eyes up to see how beautiful life is, how great God is, how we have way more to praise about than we do to complain about. Number six, I will greet this day with a forgiving spirit. I will forgive myself. That's the hardest person to forgive right there. I can forgive people who've done the worst things to me, but sometimes it's so hard to forgive me. And the more resentful you are towards yourself or towards others, the more cynical you become and the more harder you become. This is how ruthless she lived with the forgiving spirit. She, she just kept forgiving Naomi's spirit. She just kept on forgiving whatever it was that she could have held onto, she just forgave. Number seven, final point here. I will persist without exception. I am a person of victory. I refuse to quit. I refuse to throw in the towel. Would you stand your feet all over this place? God has a field for you. God has a purpose for you. God has provision for you. God has the right girl for you, the right guy for you. God has the destiny lined up for you. If you wouldn't mind just taking this moment very seriously, I promise we'll dismiss in just a few minutes, but this is the most important moment in the service. If you're here today and you just need to surrender something to Jesus, maybe, maybe you've ran from God, maybe you've been following Jesus, but you know there's some areas in your heart that you just need to get right with God. You need to say, Lord, you have access to this area in my life. Lord, today I'm gonna be a person of action. I am not going to sit back and watch other people take a step towards their purpose, a step towards victory. Today is my day. All across this room with heads bowed, eyes closed, if you're watching online, and this is your decision to make. If you need to get some things right with God today, I want you to raise your hand all over this room. God's talking to you, sir. He's talking to you, ma'am. Today is your day. Purpose is knocking at the door. Forgiveness is knocking at the door. Grace is knocking at the door. Favor is waiting for you in the field of your purpose. And today it's time to shake off discouragement, shake off apathy, shake off excuses, shake off any reason that would hold you back from stepping into the future that God has for you. Secondly, you're here today and you just say, Paul, I need supernatural favor. 
I have been in the field, I've been working, but I need a breakthrough. I need God to show up. I need the favor that Ruth had. I need God to do something in my finances, in my health, in my marriage, in my family. If you need a miracle, if you need the favor of God, something you can't do in human effort that that would require supernatural help, I want you to raise your hand. I wanna pray for a breakthrough in your finances that God's gonna show up, that he's gonna bring favor on whatever it is you've been praying for. If you raise your hands for any of those or you just need to get to the altar, leave your seat right now. Just come and join me right here at this altar. Come on, today is the day. Today is the day to step into the future God has for you. Today is the day to release the past and to embrace the future. Today is the day to get up from discouragement. Get up from shame. Get up from fear. Get out of that addiction. Get out of that spirit of discouragement and to get moving in the field of your purpose. Let's just begin to worship God all over this place. Let's shift our focus to Him this morning. Come on, may His favor be upon you. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. God is not finished with your story. He's not finished with your family. He's not finished with your destiny. He's not finished with your dreams. He's a healer. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's your provider. He's your protector. He's your redeemer. He's your restorer. He's blessing you to be a blessing. He forgives you. He loves you. He's with you. He's for you. He's going to open up doors for you. As you step towards those doors, he's going to begin to open those doors up. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you. He's renewing your mind, he's renewing your heart, he's renewing your life. to pray for people that need healing in a relationship. If you need healing in a relationship, I want you to just come to the altar if you're willing to. I know it requires a lot of humility to do that, but if you're here today and you're just desperate for God to heal a relationship in your family, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's between you and your son, you and your daughter, you and your dad, you and your mom, whatever that is, I just felt as I was praying at the altar just to invite anyone who needs healing in a relationship. And then also I want to pray for singles that have been in a season where you have been waiting for the right person and it's just gotten harder and harder to wait. I wanna invite you to come down to the altar. Again, I know it's a humbling thing to do, but I believe on the other side, listen, God exalts those who humble themselves and he humbles those who exalt themselves. Just like Ruth came in a humble posture, a very bold, humble posture. She went to a field that she wasn't invited to and she showed up and God showed up. 
if you will take a step to just say, Lord, I'm asking you. I'm asking you, God, for strength. I'm asking you, whatever that is, as you're coming to this altar right now, Lord, I just pray. God, you know what they're walking through. You know what they have walked through. You know what they've been through. You know what they're going through right now. And Lord, you are a healing God. You are a gracious God. Lord, you are a forgiving God. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God who works in families that aren't perfect. You're the God who, Lord, reconciles relationships that have been broken and and shattered by discouragement, by tough, bad decisions. I thank you that today, God, that you can turn things around. God, just like you healed relationships in Joseph's family, in Jacob's family, for Isaac. Lord, just like you healed relationships in Abraham's family, I pray, God, that you would bring healing today in relationships, in homes, in marriages, in families. Just raise your hands up to heaven all over this room. I just pray right now, God, that the grace of God would just cover you. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children your children come on for your future your children, children for your future marriage be upon you in a between brothers and sisters and between family, sons and fathers children, mothers and daughters husbands children, and wives for every single in the room that's been waiting that's been patient be they've sowed in tears They've waited, God. They've persevered. Your children, their children, their children, they favor me upon you in a thousand generations. Your family, your children, their children, may his presence, may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you. says that Jesus intercedes for us, stands at the right hand of the throne. He defends you. He loves you. He's for you. He is for you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, that you would sow the pieces of someone's heart that have been torn, that you're sewing it back together with your presence, with your mercy, with your compassion, with kind words today, with your messages, God, with the worship. I just pray, Lord, that you would just start the healing journey, the healing work in that relationship, in that home. Lord, I pray for the single in the room that's just felt discouraged in their waiting season. 
that guy, that girl, she's waited, he's prayed, he's been crying out to you, God. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would lead him into the field, God, of the right person that you have for him. Lord, just favor in that field. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, just for, God, unusual favor, that it had to be you just a, a story that only heaven could write, a love story that only heaven could work through, through all the valleys and all the breakups and all the heartbreaks. I thank you, God, that you're writing a, a story that would bring you glory. And God, we surrender to you. Just say this with me. Jesus, I surrender to you. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. I repent of my sin and I receive your forgiveness. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. God, I need you. I need your favor. I'm trusting in you. I receive your grace. I receive your favor. By faith, I will walk in victory. My best days are right in front of me. God is not finished with me yet. In Jesus' name,